Hey everybody, Hanko here with my live reaction or read through for Tower of God chapter 631 or season 3 episode 214. I'm excited to read, very excited. I've been thinking a lot about Tower of God and I'm going to warn you ahead of time, because of that, I'm going to be doing a long Haku intro. I was sitting around just excited to read, thinking about this ahead of time, and I was just like, oh, I want to, I need to talk about that before I, before I get into the reaction. Oh, and I need to talk about that. And I need to talk about that. And eventually I was like, that's just going to take me a couple minutes to get through. So if I had had the foresight, I would have just made it a separate discussion video earlier today, but I uh, did not have the foresight for that. I'm not Zahard nor Kel Helm here. So... I'm just going to talk a little bit because of things that we saw last week, because last week's chapter is massive. Pretty monumental, actually. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I watch everybody else's reactions. Uh, so let's let's talk about Tower of God a little bit beforehand. I think last week's chapter was like the biggest theory killer chapter that we have ever had in the entire series, because some of the most massive theories out there or the most massive ones you've seen, especially lately, Bomb is a Hard Sun. Well, he looks a lot like V. Some people have said that V's facial features look a little different than Bomb. I don't think they look that different, and I think they look a lot... Like, they don't look much like past Bomb, but current Bomb, with the current art style, they look pretty similar. I just feel like any differences there can be chalked up to the art style changing and becoming what it is now. Uh, he looks slightly different, but the biggest thing, I wasn't expecting the blue eyes. For some reason, there was somebody else who said the same thing. Was it Dr. Bonehead? It might have been Dr. Bonehead. I was like, I always envisioned V for some reason having black hair and black eyes. I don't know why I pictured him having black eyes, but that's just kind of what I thought he would have so the blue eyes were a surprise to me and there was somebody else who again I watched a bunch of reactions I don't remember exactly who but there was somebody else who said the same thing that they were like for some reason they thought his eyes would be black too um so really the difference there is that Bomb has Arlen's hair color they both have the light kind of dark brown hair and presumably they both have golden eyes so Bomb being Zahard's kid might be a killed theory from last week's chapter. Another theory that might be a killed theory from last week's chapter is that Mircea took over V's body. Uh, I don't think that current Mircea looks anything like what we just saw of V. Again, this is past V, not current V, but even like if you imagine the V that we saw, if you age him up, even then I don't think he looks like what we saw from Merchia. I think Merchia is just Merchia. There's going to be something else that explains uh, the eye color change to gold. There's going to be something that explains the weird part of his face. Maybe he's got something going on with a deal with an ancient like Evankel's got going on in Kelhelm. Maybe that's what's going to be used to explain it. So there could be that. As for his eyes changing from purple to gold, or at least one of them, in the flashback Merchia had two purple eyes and then in the future he has the messed up purple eye on the like scarred part of his face but also a golden eye i think that that is again part of him being a part of the grace family because we've got grace arlen grace mercia lizlek and juvial grace and grace being at the end there i think is you know just signifying that he is um his that his mother is arlen so I think that the golden eyes are a Grace family trait. And as for how as for how Mercia ended up like that, it could be explained in a lot of different ways. Either way, we know at some point he got Arlen's family name. And we still don't get to know V's real name. That's another thing at the end of last chapter. They just hit us with the commonly known as V. They don't give us his real name. I still think because he's Juvial Grace, I think that the Ju family name is going to be... Um, is going to be V's family name, so there's going to be that. But my best guess for the eye color change and the differences in Mercia. In the past, we see Mercia sneaking around using a dagger, tries to fight close up with. I mean, then again, in present, he kind of fights pretty close up with Yurik, but that's because that's the kind of fighter Yurik tends to be from what we've seen of him so far. I think Yurik can do a lot more. It's just that. When he doesn't have to, he's not going to. He's just trying to, you know, have fun, do like the do what he needs to. He's not gonna just fire beams out of everywhere if he doesn't need to. Um, 
but he was using a knife and stuff. And then when we see him with Mergia, he's just throwing spells everywhere. We know that Arlen was a specialist in spells, so my best guess for what happened with Mercia and the change we saw, I definitely don't think he took over V's body. I really think that I didn't like that theory to begin with because I think it takes away a bit too much from Mercia as his own character, but even then I think it's pretty dead now. My best guess is that it's similar to it's similar to what happened with Zahard giving his blood and power somehow to the princesses. They become part of the Zahard family and they gain crazy power. Like, Andrasi's just a regular, but the thing with her is that even as just a regular, she's extremely resilient. I mean, she's standing here with family heads, and some of that is just plot stuff, but even before that, we've known that, you know, like, when the workshop's soldiers were coming at her or whatever, she had, like, level 100 security or something like that, and, like, wasn't even phased. She is just, and, like, some of the attacks and things she was hit with in the past, it's like she is just crazy, crazy durable as a princess, and princesses can deal with, like, really dense Shinsu concentration, some things we've seen from Yuri. So, with her being a princess, like, she gets part of Zahard's power, Zahard doesn't want people to have kids because it's going to be, it's going to be passing down his power, which is how we get, you know, the second Anak, who, again, has these crazy physical abilities just being what is essentially the adopted grandchild of Zahard, but... I mean, there's blood in there and how she became the grandchild. So I think whatever method that Zahard used to give his, you know, powers, at least some of them, to the princesses, I think that Arlen used that to give some of her powers to Mercia, and that's why Mercia has her family name now. That's why Mercia uses spells like she does now. I think that that would be the explanation. And if so, I think, again, it might have been Dr. Bonehead that brought up that that would kind of almost make him like an older sibling to Bond. That would almost make him more of an adopted child to uh, V and Arlen, which could, again, be a possible thing. If, say, like, we don't even know how recently this change could have happened. Let's say that he didn't have any of these spell powers, he didn't have any of Arlen's power, and he wasn't, you know, strong enough to be ranked 15, up there with, like, a lot of the family heads. Let's say he wasn't that strong, but then, you know, V takes himself out when their child is killed. So now Arlen's left, no child, no V. And she's like, well, I gotta find a way to leave the tower to resurrect the kid. Maybe sh maybe it's as even recent as that. It feels weird calling that recent. But it's as recent as her leaving the tower when she gave her powers to Mercia and then left with Bomb. And kind of left him to sort of lead FUG now that her and V were going to be gone and out of the picture. I guess maybe that is a possibility. Or it could be even further back than that and she could have given him the powers even when V and original bomb, original Viol was still alive. Who knows? But I think that's my thoughts there. So again, Bomb is a hard kid theory. Maybe dead, probably dead. Um, <laughs> Merchie is in V's body. That's almost certainly dead. I saw some people saying that this meant that Ghost is V as a theory is dead. I don't really think so. I think Akadion can still be V. I think that he, or like some sort of remnant or leftover of V, I think that's still possible. Maybe not, because we just don't know enough yet. We don't know because Akriyung is working with Hedon and Rachel and Revolution, which has connections to the Red Light District. So with all of that swirling around, we just don't have the information yet. Like Akriyung, Akriyung could be his own completely different thing. Could be more connected to head on stuff than to V and family head stuff, but it could still be a connection to V there. I don't really, even though Akriyung's eyes are yellow and um, V's eyes are blue, I just think that that could be a part of the armor or whatever. So, like, I don't think that it necessarily rules anything out. Or are his eyes red? I don't remember. I think his eyes are yellow. But either way, that could be another theory that's potentially dead. Um, Gosh, there's so much to talk about just from last week's chapter before I even start reading. Like, we already knew, like, not from the main series itself, but we knew from the blog posts that the workshop 
inhabited the tower and were already here before the family heads and Zahard. They predated them in the tower. But now we have this guy with this rice pot. He's <laughs> saying that they're beta testers for it. We have all this technology down there. And this makes it seem like not only were they already there, not only did they did they predate the great warriors, they predated them by a long time. They're already, like, established. They have stuff up and down the tower that the Great Warriors don't even know about that they're just stumbling upon. So this, again, like, the workshop is something that's been mysterious. They have a lot of knowledge and info. They exist inside and outside of the tower. And this just deepens the importance of the workshop even further. So there's that. There's the God of Guardians-like guy that we saw. And... A bunch of people were saying, no, no, it, it's the real, the one God of Guardians. But I just, I don't think we have enough information to just say that. I feel like from what little we saw at the end of last week, I think there's kind of three options. A, it could just be the God of Guardians who was created by the workshop, bat, or <laughs> created by the workshop battle, created by the workshop to, you know, oversee the rice pot training and everything and again if they're beta testers then who is the intended user is it intended for the child of prophecy or bomb or whatever to come later on is it intended that they're testing it on irregulars to then use it on regular towerborn people later on and that's a part of how they're developing the fitbit kind of stuff is that what they're testing for there could be a lot of things so is this guy just the one and only God of Guardians? And we know he was eventually put on the Hell Train, and at some point I believe they referenced that, he, that some of his memories had been altered or wiped. So he has had some of his memories changed, which is why he didn't remember V or Arlen. He only remembered Zahard, really. So his memories have been messed with. Is it just the one and only? Or... Are there more than one? Is there one that gets put on the train, one that's here? Are there just multiple gods of guardians since they were, like, made by the workshop? They're an artificial construct. Or the third option, which I actually think would be pretty neat. I think this would be a neat option. Is this a workshop researcher? Is this guy a is this guy somebody that's actually from the workshop and the God of Guardians was an artificial person made to look like this person or maybe this guy dies and made to carry on this guy's work or something like that. So again, this guy could be the one and only, there could be multiple Gods of Guardians, or this guy could be like the original human and the God of Guardians was a, I hate to say fake person, but a fake person made in his image. Like we don't know enough info on that yet. Also, I don't have enough information, but like some of the crazy stuff we saw, we saw a family head die. We, we, like, we all assumed, uh, yeah, Gaston, or Gaston's gonna be fine, but he actually died. We saw a family head die, which is a massive, massive thing, and it just happened like that. Of course, I think it's definitely on purpose, because, um, all this time, Traumary's been like, oh, I'm not at fault for the Enkidu stuff. Enkidu, you did that. So what if I controlled you? I'm a ruler. That's my right. Or just the way that he's been deflecting blame for a lot of the stuff that he's done. And the way that we saw with Gastang, where Gastang is like, you know, I don't want to believe that my close friend is kind of evil and murdered another one of our friends. But... I'm not confident enough to have Enkidu executed. I kind of want to keep Enkidu around just in case Enkidu is telling the truth. And we that's been going on for thousands of years. So at this point, he's like, you know what, Traumare? I'm just going to die, have this contract with the scale of judgment or whatever, and use the contract I've made to give my own life and sacrifice to look at the record of your sins. And we got into some like crazy stuff like, records of sins and things like that and the book of judgment and all that and it said like the master's scale of judgment or whatever so this was something presumably if the master is the father of everything mcseth then mcseth created this thing which is again just hyping up the workshop even more the workshop and mcseth are absolutely nuts so let's say so gastang sacrifices himself and I think, of course, that Traumary is going to continue to be like, no, I'm not guilty. I'm not at fault. And he's going to continue to deny his guilt. And that's what's going to allow Gaston to be revived as the executioner. And then that is where things get crazy. If he, if Gaston gets revived as the executioner, 
do one of them have to die? Like, does he have to kill Traumery? There's no leaving Traumery alive. Or if he doesn't kill Traumery, even if he does kill Traumery, actually, whether he kills Traumery or not, after Gastang is revived, does he just get to stay revived? Or is part of this contract just he comes back to kill Traumere and then he has to pay up and die anyway? Like, does this only let him come back as the executioner to take Traumere down with him? Like, we don't really have enough info on that yet, on how his rebirth is going to go. And I forget which one of you it was. It might have been Zenon, I think. Zenon's been leaving a lot of really great long comments. Uh, recently, I think it could have been them who a while back said something that I really, really liked in terms of the contracts where I think it was name hunt station that we got like harder confirmation, but we've known for a while. We know the great warriors with the exception of blood matter at first, but his, a special came later and V they took the immortality contract. You would assume then we've seen they can't take themselves out. Arlen's not allowed to do it. Bellarir said that Gaston can't take himself out, that somebody else has to do it. Um, and I would think that's because they made the contract for immortality. They made the contract. They can't break the contract that they made. Uh, in addition to that, I think it's immortality as in they won't die of old age. It's probably very hard to kill them. But... It's not the same as the King's Contract. We've had it told to us, I think, in Name Hunt. I know we definitely had it told to us in the walls, I think. It was uh, reiterated. Again, I think. I'm just working off memory here. Where Zahart has the King's Contract. The King's Contract means that nobody born in the tower can kill him. So I would assume that means you could stab him in the heart, but if you're born in the tower, it just will not work. It will not affect him. Kind of like if somebody who... Kind of like how Kaiser and the Ten Bosses were meant to be this, you know, sort of false Zahard and Ten Family Heads that existed on the Name Hunt Station. Kind of like if you tried to attack Kaiser without following the rules of the contract, you would just get disintegrated. The, um, the administrator, the Guardian, would just say, you know, you broke the rules, you're evaporated into nothing. So if you're a Towerborn and try to kill Zahard or something, I wonder if that just happens. If it's just like, nope, you can't do it. Unless you have a rule-breaking power, or unless you're from outside of the tower like you're in a regular. Um, but that's the King's Contract. We've never been told that the family heads have anything like that. We've been told they have immortality contracts. So again, they might not age or die after a certain point and they can't take themselves out because they can't break their own contract. But here, Traumere just kills Gaston. Is it because specifically Traumere is an, is an irregular, or could theoretically any Towerborn that's strong enough take out a family head? I think that that makes a lot of sense because a lot of the things we've seen of the family heads and a lot of things characters have said about them, a lot of the setup with the Coon family and stuff, it's like... Why would characters think this if the, like, they know they have immortality contracts. Why would they think this about their family head if they thought that they couldn't be killed? So it might be the case that nobody born in the tower can kill Zahard, but the family heads are just immortal as in they won't age or, like, die of old age or whatever. They can actually be killed. It's just that pretty much nobody in the tower is strong enough to do so unless they're already an irregular. Like, you could argue maybe a Dory or N would be strong enough, but N was sealed away, and why would a Dory want to? You could argue that, again, maybe Murchia is strong enough, but he hasn't had that opportunity, because if he comes out and shows himself, generally the family heads will try to counteract whatever he's doing. Um, or Bakrion. Could Bakrion, if he wanted to, if he wasn't seemingly a bit of a pacifist, just trying to escape the tower with Yurik, could Bakrion technically potentially kill one of the family heads. I think that it adds to the stakes and it makes a lot of sense that way. That They just don't have the king's contracts like Zahar does and they could be killed. It's just that who's really strong enough to kill them that's also like wanting and willing to kill them. So there's that and beyond a family head dying, getting to meet V, seeing more about the workshop. And again, like the workshop's established here it, it just makes me think about the wider tower as a whole, because we see more about these machines, too, 
And we know that the Machine Nation and the Five Flower Kingdoms existed before the Great Warriors made their climb. There were already people that were Tower Natives by the time that the Great Warriors were making their climb. There were the Ancient Ones, the, or the like Ancient Creatures, uh, the Native Ones, which seemed to be just a subset of Ancient Creatures that were already existing in the Tower. We know that even with the humans that were Tower Natives, that flowers and machines predated them. We see the machines or giant mechanoids here being fought. And I like that giant mechanoid as a translation. It's a little clunky, but I like it a lot more than the scans just calling them robots. Robots just feels too generic for them. But they existed before people, and it just makes me wonder. Again, I mentioned it in last week's reaction. The tower seems to be a physical construct with things like actual physical lights and a ceiling. It's said, I think, that um, Edwan has attacks that can pierce through floors into, like, more floors and stuff. He can, like, just pierce through the tower, attacking through multiple floors if he wants to. So it seems to be an actual physical construct, and it is massive. It is like every floor. I always took it when I was like, I think I misread when I was like reading earlier on. And I always took it as like, oh, it's like the size of North America. But I actually think the um, blog said it was each floor is the size of the Americas, like two continent size for each floor. And you would think even if the family heads have been there for 10,000, 20,000 years, the time it takes them to climb to the top, establish Sahard's empire, start, you know, colonizing the tower, there are places that are existing way outside of what we've seen so far. And I'm wondering, when it comes to the construction of the tower, what's living there? Do the machines have something to do with how the tower was built? Does the workshop have something to do with the tower that, or like how the tower was built? We know that the god of nature and god of machines were mentioned. Are those axes? Are they former irregulars that have entered the tower and maybe they're still up on higher floors and there are just more irregulars that we don't know about yet uh, that just like predated the Zahard Empire? Is that a possibility? Because if um, White, if Joaquin can set himself up as a god for these two kingdoms and have them go to war, it's like, are these gods just legends passed down of like really, really powerful people that were in the tower beforehand? So there's that. And then in terms of language, that's the last thing I want to talk about before I start reading. When it comes to language in the tower, you got to remember that everybody here is speaking different languages. It's just being translated through the pocket into Mixethian or Mixeth. And if the pocket gets broken, they can't really communicate anymore. And in fact, we have already seen evidence of languages that aren't translatable because we saw it with the group going to try to find uh, Yan Woon, where they ran into, I think they were called the Kukum, and the Kukum, their language wasn't like this was outside of where Zahard's empire had spread. And we've seen, you know, more instances of places outside of Zahard's empire. We just recently saw Yuri, like, fighting that one group of tower indigenous people to help spread the empire as part of her being, like, conscripted into the army as her punishment. So we saw that with Yuri. I believe we know that Kalavan's homeland where he was guarding the essence of essence of nothingness or whatever Kalavan's homeland is somewhere that's outside of the Zahard Empire so there's a lot of places out there the Kukum language that was a place outside of the empire their language hadn't even been researched and entered into the pocket so the pocket couldn't even translate their language but we had Evan there with the team so Evan could just be like, oh, I speak Kukum, I can translate, it's fine. And so we have languages that are outside of that, and why I think that's important is we've seen a lot of different writing. Uh, we saw a lot of different writing just last chapter. There was the writing that Gastang's head made, the writing in the book that the Scale of Judgment had, and I think that might be the same type of writing. And then we had the writing on the power generator's entrance for uh, where the like machine people, mechanoids were. Now, I don't know if any of it's important. I can't tell what the writing Gasang's head made and what the writing in the book is. Um, it's not Devanagari. Um, I don't think it's Sanskrit. It's definitely not, it's definitely not like anything East Asian. It's not like 
Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Mongolian. It's nothing European, like it's not Cyrillic or Roman. Um, and even Middle Eastern, it doesn't look like Arabic to me. Uh, it's not Hebrew. Don't think, you know, this is moving kind of into Europe as well, but it's not like Georgian, Armenian. I think they have their own writing systems or like Greek or anything like that. I think even though it's not Devanagari, if any of you were watching me and are from India, maybe you would know more. Maybe you'd be like, hey, even if I can't read that, I recognize it. I think it is some kind of Indic script. It does look more similar to different Indic scripts or like similar to um, Arabic. But I, again, I don't think it's Arabic. It doesn't really look like Arabic to me. Um, it looks more similar to an Indic script, though. But the thing with that is the thing about India India has like dozens of different languages that people speak and dozens of different writing systems for their different languages. And it looks kind of like one of those writing systems. Like it, it's those similar shapes. Um, but again, I can't tell specifically what it is. So I definitely couldn't translate it to see if it means anything. I remember back when we had the chapter where we saw the gravestones on like inside the tank at that place inside the Lopobia battleship, there were people who were like, oh yeah, that's an actual language and it actually means something. And in addition to that, we have um, the we have the 13 month series where the Black March, we saw it way back in season one, the Black March has um, a bunch of kanji written on it. And specifically the Black March says like um, Kuro no Sangatsu or Black Third Moon, Black March. Um, so it, we were like, okay, it's written in Japanese. It has, uh, Black Third Moon, Black March on it. It says Black March. So it's like, okay, is Asha Laduaru Japanese? And see, you said in the blog post way back then that, oh yeah, you noticed it, uh, different, there are a lot of different languages. Like there's English writing in the background on posters and stuff, Korean writing in the background on posters and stuff. So there's a lot of different languages used in Tower of God. There was whatever it was that was written on those gravestones. And all of that has meant something in the past. And he said in the blog post that, oh yeah, Ashala Dwaru wrote in Japanese on like, like inscribed Japanese on all of the 13 month series. So if all of that means something, maybe the writing in the book actually is legible and means something. But again, I don't know. The writing on the entrance to the generator area was written in Futhark. Again, I don't know if it's Elder Futhark, Younger Futhark, uh, Futhork. Um, I don't know which it is, but they're all pretty similar from my knowledge. So that's something that I think I probably could try to translate because it's probably not that difficult to just like transcribe the, uh, the runes there from Futhark to Roman letters. Um, since it is very, very just similar to something that I'd be used to since I speak English as a native language and like all of the Germanic languages like um, English, German, uh, what are the what are the northern ones? There's like English, German, Dutch. Those are the western ones. The northern ones are like what? Norwegian, Swedish, and it's not Finnish, right? Finnish is something different. Uh, and then the eastern ones all went extinct, like um, Vandal and Goth, uh, who voice crack. But um, since those languages were written in Futhark in the past and stuff, uh, before they all started using uh, Roman, then it should be kind of easy. Like, I could maybe try to see if I can translate that. But again, I don't know if it's just meaningless. It might not mean anything, but it might actually say something, given that, again, the Japanese writing, the English writing, the Korean writing, and whatever was on the gravestones, I don't remember. Was that Devanagari or Sanskrit, or was that Thai? Uh, I don't remember. Um, but that all meant something in the past, so maybe the writing we saw last chapter also means something. Again, I don't look at any other like I don't I don't use reddit or anything but I try to avoid Tower of God stuff um, except for watching other people's reactions and doing my own reactions because I don't want to be spoiled uh, so this is all just coming from my own research and my own stuff that I already know um, but I can I can try to figure something out by next week maybe I can try to see if I can look something up at least for the runes at least for the Futhark I don't know if I could I can't even figure out what the other language is 
So I definitely couldn't try to translate that if I can't even figure out what it is. But I think that's about everything. And I think it is cool that we see all of those different real world languages instead of see you just scribbling gibberish, like making up letters. It's really cool that we actually just have a bunch of random languages. And I don't know if that has, I don't think that's going to have any like actual implications for the tower to be like, oh, actually people from the real world founded the place. I don't think it's going to be anything like that. It's just that it's a way of like, you know, kind of like not making up random gibberish and putting your putting like actual real letters in there. It's a way of doing that and a way of showing different writing styles throughout the tower while it's a way to do that um, without like and like also show that they're not all speaking the same language, that it's all just being translated by their pockets. And oh man, that was about it. May, it reminded me of something. I think it might have been Ron Can who brought it up, where we know that a lot of the Kuhn family names are Spanish. They're mostly like named after uh, people from South America, but there are a lot of Spanish names when it comes to the Kuhn family. French names when it comes to the Popadao family. Like most of the names we're getting are French. So the names for the Lopobia family are all over the place. They're really all over the place. So there's been a bit of I've seen a while where people are like, is it just random? Are they supposed to have some sort of cultural connections or anything? I mean, all of Kirin stuff and a lot of the stuff in Tromare's palace looks generally East Asian inspired, but I don't know what, what kind of East Asian inspired. I mean, we've got Kirin, which is kind of like... Chinese in origin, um, but a lot of East Asia, that's kind of just a mythological thing that exists. But I think after being like, I can't really tell what that writing is, it was somebody who was like, maybe that has to do with, you know, whatever cultural connection there might be for the Lopobia family. Maybe if it is some kind of Indian, Hindic writing system, maybe then like the Lopobia family has some sort of cultural Indian connection, potentially. But again, who knows? That's just something else I thought about really quick. But I, th I think that's it. If there's anything else I forgot to talk about, I'll bring it up later on. But as for right now, I'm going to split this video so that, you know, people can jump to the reaction by just hitting the uh, chapter or whatever. But if you stuck through the discussion. Thank you so much. I just had a lot I wanted to talk about after last week's chapter. I think pretty much every topic I brought up was related to a bunch of... We got so much information. Like, like everything I talked about here for probably almost 30 minutes, if not more than 30 minutes, was stuff that we just got new information on last week. In one single week, we got all of that new info. But either way, you know, I already have talked for 30 minutes and I'm not really feeling too good today. So I've pushed through and now I get to actually like see what we get this week. Hopefully, you know, we might cut away. We might get a bomb chapter or something, but I'm hoping, you know, chapters from this arc have been hit and miss where we've had some real stinker chapters. We've had a lot that are just kind of like, yeah, I don't have a problem with them. They're not bad, but they're not great either. And then we've had a lot of incredible chapters too. So it's a very hit and miss arc with some some bad chapters, some incredible chapters. So hopefully we get another really good one. Uh, let's get into reading though. Okay, so to actually start reading, I'll I'll tell you, I, I just said it at the end of the discussion. I do not feel very good today. I have been sweating and feeling awful all day. So uh, I'm going to still, you know, continue through the reaction as normal, but I'm not not feeling super hot. We have a violence warning at the beginning, and I'm, uh, I'm excited to see what we get into. After last week, you know, when we saw somebody get beheaded, I feel like it might be, um, might be important. So we have V here. Again, the blue eyes are crazy to me. Did not expect it. How long have you been here? And why are you in your underwear? Hmm, let me think. I guess it's been about 10 minutes. We saw this last time. What? 10 minutes? We almost died out here. Why didn't you message us with our pocket? And Bomb's team. Bomb's team needs a Yirag. They, they need to communicate more. Oh, r really? The Ten Great Family Head's forgotten companion. Sorry about that. Smile with a heart. Commonly known as V. I really wish we'd get just a name already. It just makes me wonder... 
what is so special about his actual name? Why is why is CU hiding his name from us? Why is it a big deal that we don't just know what his name is other than B? And then Season 3, Battle Between the Family Heads, Traumeray's Memory Fragments, Part 1. Also, again, yeah, this is looking back at Traumeray's sins. So whatever Traumeray does here had to have been bad enough to be recorded that this is the first thing we're seeing. Like, of course, it's being used as a narrative device to give us a lot more info, but in addition to that, this is leading to some sin from Traumeray. Sorry, that's all you have to say? And <laughs> Traumeray kicks him. And then we have Flames as well from Yirang. Did you also know that we can stop the mechanoids by breaking the pipes and Kastang's choking him? Y yeah. Then why were you walking around in there naked instead of smashing the pipes? I, I was just curious to see what was in there. What? Hey, what the hell is wrong with you? And I wonder if he actually did fully make it through Revolution or not. When Bomb did Revolution, he tried it a bunch of times with the God of Guardians, but he could never, like, make it through. He could never do it. He would either get interrupted, have to do something else. He couldn't, you know, accept that power in him and stuff. So he always failed until he, you know, found his power, made peace with his, uh sworn enemy himself and you know did stuff like that he didn't really go through it until he went through it with edwan's rice pot training and edwan was like hey i've been through revolution before so it'll be easier for you to learn it under me um so it just makes me think that after bomb going through all of that did v just waltz in and learn it or is there going to be more to it hey what the hell is wrong with you they sure are an energetic bunch. W wait, this is no way to treat a friend. Friend? Ha, die, you jerk. So, have you made your decision, user? And they're not calling him beta tester, but user. Decision. What, or you mean whether I'm going to share the new power with everyone? Or keep it for myself? That's right. There's really only one possible answer to a question like that, isn't there? I want to share it with everyone, of course. And I really like this. I can't climb this tower alone. People have been bringing this up for a while, but with Zahard, not V, where they're like, Zahard took all this power for himself. What if Bomb does more of like, and the way that we have all the regulars keep climbing with him, the way that we have all of this happen, is if Bomb spreads his power out more among his friends, sort of like what we already saw happen with Kun and Rack. I don't really like that. I think the series can be written in a way where we don't need that. But again, I like it being brought up here with V, where instead of hoarding the power to himself, V spread the power out to everyone else, where Bomb has been seemingly mostly doing the opposite in a lot of ways. Like everybody else keeping up with Bomb and growing has been just them... Rising Tide um, lifts all ships, them growing strong by also fighting to stay around him and being in these tough situations, and also just the fact that pretty much all of Bomb's teammates are like top 0.1%, maybe top like 0.001% of people in the tower, of like regulars. Like, Bomb's teammates are like the absolute strongest among regulars of their level, you know? But I can't climb this tower alone. Very well. As a result of your decision, every living creature in the tower will receive the benefits of evolution. What? Of course, you won't be the only ones to evolve. Even your enemies and the seeds of evil planted within the Shinsu all around you will benefit as well. What does this mean? Revolution and evolution don't always necessarily lead to good things. Okay. That almost, the eyes on that almost remind me of uh, Dumas, where it has like the multiple rows of eyes, but it's not that similar. And I think the blue flames being with it are what also made me think that. But we're seeing blue Thrissa? Your decision might end up strengthening evil beings, and you could be affected by that very same evil. And we know that Blue Thrissa was hidden away on the second floor by FUG, or found on the second floor by FUG, something like that. So, if this is Blue Thrissa, 
I don't know. This doesn't have horns, though. But if it is meant to be Blue Thrissa, it's like, what is the origins here? You or the people around you might be hurt or even killed as a result. Are you sure you won't regret this? Yeah, I'm sure. Then, I don't want any special privileges. Is it just me? There were a couple panels of Yidong last, uh, last chapter that looked like really cheap and not great looking, like proportion wise and depth wise. And this panel also just like proportion wise and depth wise. It's like what's going on with his torso and arm and everything else. Um, I don't want any special privileges. Everyone needs that power. All right. Then your decision has been made. And again, why does V get this decision? How can the workshop just do this? And like, again, V being called user instead of a beta tester. You might fail in your quest and end up melting into the Shinsu surrounding you, but in accordance with your decision, the tower's system will forever share the power of evolution with everyone. And again, the tower's system? Like, we're getting deeper into, like, a gamification of the tower for the Great Warriors that, despite it being, you know, a lot of games imposed by the characters, we haven't seen the games imposed by the tower as much with the climb before these flashbacks. As a token of gratitude for the blessing you've bestowed upon the tower, I would like to present you with a gift. This you see here is the mysterious blue fire. It will make your chosen companion stronger and it affects them all and keep them safe. Although naturally, like all fire, it could burn you if you're not careful with it. In any case, I wish you all a most honorable journey. I'll be seeing you again, tower climbers. Great. Now let's blow the, or blow this blow this place to bits and stop those mechanoids. V. Gaston Dorkmere. Okay. Hey, wait. Did he just call me Dorkmere? Did you just call her he? Uh, don't destroy it yet. What? We all came or we came all this way, and now you've changed your mind. I just want to try out this new power. What? Give me a minute. What do you mean? Just wait. V. He, he's so fast. He might even be faster than Edwan's lightning. Really? Don't just stand there gaping at him. Hey, V, stop right there. How strange. Huh? I know he doesn't have any, but it's almost like... V has wings. Wings to fly with. And again, that is kind of related to the Icarus stuff we saw back in the Grace chapter. Maybe you're seeing his lips flapping. God, that's hot. He's burning and screaming. Yeah, maybe. I remember now. Perhaps we enjoyed ourselves at the time, but in the end it was a tragic decision. It's difficult to recall my emotions, but I do remember one thing. The tower was far more cruel than amusing back then. Or maybe. And now we're back out of the riding. It was just us. Th they keep coming. I guess we're skipping ahead into the future then, some. And the first sin was accepting that power, I guess. They keep coming. We have mechanoids piling up towards the door. There are too many of them. R.I.P. people reading on your phone, because I'm reading on PC and this is like so many screens worth. I can't imagine reading mobile. There's no way you can see what's going on. If we don't open the waterway soon, then it's a hard punches into this paneling. We're both doomed. Damn it. Or no, he's not punching into it. He's banging on it. Hedwan, Yudin. We had no trouble opening the door when we came in here. Why won't it open now? Shit. Oh no. There's a whole army of them. And we're not even allowed to kill a single mechanoid or we'll fail the test. Any minute now. And they're getting overwhelmed. They'll be here. It's your fault for rushing in there without a proper plan. I thought you were supposed to be smart. And now it looks like we have trauma, right? We didn't expect a sudden mechanoid attack like that. We were just trying to rescue the people inside. What should we do? Pretty m or pretty soon the mechanoids will be all over those two. And Yidong is with uh, trauma, right? 
But we can't open the floodgates right now. If we do, we see people down there. All those people, they died trying, er, they try, all those people they tried to save will die. The goal of this test is to open the waterway and wipe out all the mechanoids. But that's a trap. And V is with them. By opening the waterway, we'll be killing those people. I'll go down and try to save them. What? But that's suicide. I mean, don't say that around V. Uh, there isn't enough time. The mechanoids will reach those two first. If you go down there now, you'll be caught up in the massacre as well. Are you trying to make the decision even more difficult for us? But, Gastang, so hard. I'll do it. And then, Traumerate, wait, what are you thinking? As you all know, I don't really like people. Traumerate? But, hold on, there must be another way. You all are different. Oh, is this the first big sin he kills all these innocent people in order to protect his comrades? You might end up liking them someday. Stop. Traumerate. And we have this burst above them. And this flooding Shinsu. The waterway's open. Oh no, says Gastang. All those people. They try to run. No. Traumerate closes his eyes. And it rushes in. I... I might get some criticism for saying this. But the art doesn't look very good this week to me. <laughs> we have the water rushing down. While they are all in the safe areas. I do like the concept though. Of Traumery putting into action what he's been saying here. Where it's like. There's us and them, and Traumeray at this point only cares about the us. And then, over the thousands of years, what he considers the us gets smaller and smaller, to the point where now he's even willing to kill Gaston. The tower made us cruel. And again, I think it's neat that he's pulling a literal lever here. To be like what they said last time with um, how many levers have we had to pull, where I was saying it's probably um, it's probably metaphorical, and here it's like okay they are he's pulling the lever which is to kill other people. It's a tough decision killing other people, but to protect the people he cares about. And it's like how many times if like not literally pulling a lever, but how many times. Have we had to make these decisions? Have we had to be made cruel? Have we had to say, okay, it's us or them and I'm picking us? Maybe. Even crueler than we expected. Wh what the hell could it be? Those people here weren't the only ones. Much more so. And we see a bunch of bodies left behind. Traumary looking down. Does that mean we're sinners? And it ends there. Okay, so we just continue on. I think there wasn't as much this week. The big thing is probably... Well, the big thing is probably the stuff that Traumery is going through. Him, like, pulling the lever, becoming a sinner here, choosing, hey, putting into practice what he's been saying in the series for a while, us versus them, and him being like... I'm going to choose us. I'm going to protect my comrades, even if it's a tough decision. Even if I have to, like, make a harsh decision and kill other people, if it means protecting my comrades, that's what I care about. We've seen that again and again from Traumery's story, and we're seeing that here. Other big things, though, the tower going through evolution, the way that apparently the tower just functions like a game system and can just do that. The fact that the workshop has any sort of control over that. The fact that V is the one that gets to make that decision. Um, and he's being called user instead of more beta testers. It just like, so all of them are irregulars, but how special is V? Again, there's so much more to learn. The whole being given the flame thing seems, it feels a little bit cheesy, a little bit generic. Um, and the art this week was like, really not great a lot of the time. I don't know what's going on there, but it's something people have been complaining about for a long time though, the massive long panels that are like way too long and 
we don't really get that much out of them. I think in the past, the art conveyed things much better and felt much more unique. And I feel like just doing bigger shots doesn't really help. Um, so uh, it was a good chapter. I don't think it was anywhere as good as last week, but it was very good again. And yeah, I guess we'll just have to wait another week to see what comes next. As for me, I get to go watch a bunch of other people's reactions though, so I'm excited for that. I'll end things here because I have a bunch of editing to do after that long intro. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here. Like if you did like the video, comment down there to tell me what you thought of this week's chapter, my thoughts and reaction. Subscribe for more. Uh, Tower of God, much more on the channel. Follow on Twitter if you want. If you're a link to the Discord, it's free and open for anyone. If you want to help support the channel by dropping a super thanks, it is appreciated. If you want to help support the channel, also get your name at the end of uh, videos and get One Piece videos early. Then hit join down below to become a member, or go to patreon.com slash haku of the tubes, or a link will be in the description to become a patron. Thank you so much to people who are already patrons and members. I haven't updated this yet. I need to go through and update it again. It's just I didn't have time to today, and the past two days before today, I didn't have any internet. So, finally, internet came back yesterday afternoon, and then... Uh, today I just haven't had time, but I need to go through and update things. But until then, thank you to Chosen Regular Evan Holly, Magical Girls, Efrano Abyss Knight, J.A. and the D-Band, Cherryton Students, David Langstaff and Volded Ghoul, Slayer Candidates, S.G. and Stan Cedar, and Pure Element, Pate Ardiallo. Thank you all so, so much for your support. Thank you so much for watching and being here. Thank you, and I'll see you all next time.